Just want to make sure everybody was seated and ready to go. Well, good evening. I'm Erica Kaler. I work at Ally Financial. And um, Sam asked me to give this presentation because at my last job, I used to actually run an entire scrum team off of a Trello board, or more accurately, several Trello boards. <laughs> but we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> All right, so is there anybody here who has not ever seen Trello before? Doesn't know what it is? Maybe I've seen it. Really. Okay. Yeah, it's more like an online list. It's kind of like an online corkboard mm -hmm. that lets you have lists of things and it's very nice and hyper customizable. So it is also an Atlassian product. Um, Now, when I was setting up this presentation, I got the voice of my ninth grade algebra teacher in my head. <laughs> he used to say all the time, now I know what you're thinking and you're wrong. <laughs> and then he would go off and he would do stuff and he would say, but you won't learn that till algebra two. <laughs> So as I was setting this up, I realized there's a whole bunch of stuff where I was sitting there thinking, it's like, oh yeah, you can do this. Now I know what you're thinking and you're wrong. <laughs> and then there'll be a few things that I'll tell you where I'm like, I'm not going to go into every single detail because there's a lot of features out there. And some of them are only available if you have a paid version of Trello. So I'll tell you when you won't learn that till algebra two. <laughs> Sam warns us about that kind of stuff too. And sometimes you have to have the paid version. Right, stuff. right. So I'm going to try to avoid stuff that you only get when you're in the paid versions, uh, partially because I don't have a paid version. <laughs> so I can't really show you things I can't access. Um, but there are additional features. I just want you to know that I can't show you at this time. So, um, so the first, now I know what you're thinking is what do I need another list app for? It's not like there aren't half of a dozen of these out there. Um, Trello has a sweet spot. Trello is perfect if you've got a project that is too large for a spreadsheet, but too small for a database. If it's not worth the trouble of setting up a database, but that spreadsheet's getting way too complex and it's not really helping out as much as you'd like, that is where your Trello sweet spot hits. It provides a lot of easy collaboration because you can let other people in to see and manipulate things that are on your boards. It's highly customizable because you set it up to do it the way you want to do it. It's also a very visual interface, which is great when you're working with external stakeholders because it's something that's easy for them to intuit and that you can look at. It's nice and pretty. And, and it gives you visuals that might be lacking in something like JIRA. And you can also see some nice, lovely real-time updates. Um, and I do like that. It's one of the things I don't like about JIRA is I have to keep refreshing my screen when people change stuff. With Trello, most of the time you don't have to do that. If somebody's moving the cards around, you see it when they do it. All right, come on. All right, so here's your basics on Trello. This is how Trello is set up. It has workspaces, and this is going to be your collaborative groups, essentially. And then you're going to have a board, which is their basic unit. 
And then within the board, you have lists. Now you create these lists. It doesn't create them for you. And then within a list, you have cards. And the cards are gonna be the things that are gonna do your heavy lifting. That's where you're gonna put all of your information. That's where you're gonna set up all of your stuff. The cards live within the lists, the lists live within the boards, the boards live within the workspaces. So that's sort of your baseline organization of how it, it works. Now, the fun part about this is it lets you do it however you want. Unlike some other management systems, it's not going to prescribe to you that this is how you have to organize things. The big drawback of Trello is it lets you do it however you want, and it doesn't prescribe how you organize things, <laughs> which means it can get very chaotic very, very fast. And there will be a couple of places where I'll warn you that this is where people like to go off the rails when they use Trello. Mm -hmm. So the best key to Trello is if you're going to use it, you need to think about your organization and how you organize it, because I can pretty much guarantee somebody is going to go off the tracks and try to do something that's going to disrupt that organizational structure. And the more they go off the tracks, the less and less useful Trello is going to be because it's not going to be as organized anymore. Question. Yes. Is Trello so open that anybody with access to a board can sabotage it? Or can you restrict who has the ability to like create new columns or you know or additional workspace? I think once you give them access to the board, they have access to do whatever they want. There's a few things that are are reserved for admins, but as far as things like creating lists and cards, I think that's open to anybody who has access to the board. Gotcha. Because that's kind of the point is to, to have it be a collaborative tool. Mm -hmm. So I don't know as much about restricting at that level, but you can restrict via workspaces who can see what boards. Mm -hmm. So, and you are also able to give somebody access to just one individual board and not every board in the workspace. So those are things that you can do to restrict access. All right, so workspaces. This is your first unit, and this is going to be, again, this is your group, your working groups. So you can see here, I've got this one. This is actually, Delavan is, my, is for my rental house. And I have a board in there so that I can share with the tenants like um, work updates that need to be done. I can collect quotes. I can do things like that. You'll notice there is only one board in that workspace. That's all we have. Um, here's my personal workspace. And you can see I've got multiple things. I've got a couple of different things going on. I've got something for my writing stuff. I've got some things for my old job in there. Um, this lovely one here called Kanban is actually one that I share with a friend of mine who is my mentor and scrum master. He taught me most of everything I needed to know about being a scrum master and we continue to work on collaborative projects together. I'm helping him write a book and he's helping me learn scrum better. Um, and so some of these are our collaborative workspaces that we use to to work together. So we've got this one here, the build a zoo game is one of his projects and the magical help items help desk is one of my projects and I've got a novel plotting thing. So you can see this is how we kind of group it so that you have the workspaces and you can designate, okay, well, there's two members in this workspace. There's only one member in this workspace. You can have multiple members, as many as you want to invite to the workspace. Um, I will tell you, that uh, Atlassian, if you have the free version, restricts you to having 10 boards in a workspace. Is there, a, or, or, if, you have, if you answer this, I apologize, but on the free version, do you have a restriction to the number of workspaces? I do not know. I have not hit a restriction on that. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but it does restrict the number that you're allowed to have in a particular workspace. For your for your rental house, how do you, how do the, your tenants access it? I mean, they have, they have their own. Yeah, they have their um, own login to it, and they can go into it. Um, 
and view it. Now I can send out an invitation to anybody I want their email. And it'll ask them if they want to set up an account to go see the to go see the board. So they don't have to have a pre existing account for that, but they will have to have an account to get into it. Okay, so I guess like I said, I don't even, don't you how do I say I've never seen Trello before? How do I get how do I bring it up? Do I have to download something on my computer? No, it's entirely up. web based. Okay. It's entirely web based. It's Trello.com. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And it's mobile. And it does have a mobile app as well. And I do use it on the mobile app, in fact. So, and again, it's just, it's, it's really good for, I use it a lot for personal projects. I will tell you one of the things I'm going to be showing you is for my podcast. I actually have a Trello board to help manage my podcast. And like I said, I'm helping to, to manage my rental house. And it's a really easy way for me to sort of collect issues that need to be dealt with, to collect quotes on getting work done, uh, to sort of keep a running list of maintenance items, that kind of thing. So like I said, bigger than the spreadsheet, smaller than the database. The projects are great for that. All right, basics on boards. So ideally a board is gonna be one project or one overall grouping of something. Like you'll notice I had one called training inventory. That was my inventory thing where things kind of shifted around a lot. So I kept it on a Trello board. A uh, daily scrum board or a Kanban board are great uses for Trello. Um, my podcast production board, I use it to write books. Um, I, I'm allowed, I can keep files on there. I can rearrange the order of things. Uh, I can do plotting because it's a much more visual interface. Mm -hmm. So like I said, um, I even have seen people uh, keep recipes like each card is a recipe and then they can have the lists oh. would divide it up to be like, these are chicken recipes. These are beef recipes. These are vegetarian recipes. Oh. <laughs> so, I mean, you can use it for a lot of different things like that. All right, here, where I'm gonna go and kind of show you So at its very basis, this is what a board looks like. It just pops up here and it shows you a little bit, a couple of buttons and whatnot, but it does, you'll notice it doesn't have any lists preloaded. Now I do believe they have added some templates since the last time I really started using this. Um, I, so I haven't worked with the templates much personally, but again, it's giving you your nice blank canvas right here. If you wanted something really quick, you could say to do. Here's my to do, here's my working, and here's my done. Now, I have a Kanban board or a daily scrum board, just as simple as that. So you basically just come in here, enter the list title, type in whatever you want, hit enter, boom, you're done. Now they do have some different customization options. And if you come over to this little three dots here, there's a menu. So that'll give you, let me move this over real quick. This will give you some information that you can put in and some change, allow you to change some settings for your board. At the board level, there's not as many as there are at the card level. Um, but for instance, this is one of my favorites. You can change the background. Mm -hmm. Now you can't change it to just anything. Um, I think in the, the paid version, they let you upload a picture, but in this version, you can pick either a photo or a color. Oh wait, no, it's got custom now. It used to not let you do that. <laughs> but so say I wanna pick a photo. Um, we were talking about flowers earlier. And it's pulling these from a website called Unsplash. So these are nice, pretty 
royalty free photos. I picked that. And oh, look, now the background of my board is the lovely photo that I picked. Now, once these lists get long, you don't really see much of the background, but <laughs> it's nice to know that you can do it if you want to. And it's your reward for getting everything done. Yes, oh, yes, it is. <laughs> I feel the way I feel that way about my phone's background too, right? Mm -hmm. I said it once and then I get asked why I do that. I don't know. <laughs> yep, yep. You can, and, and this button here, you can share a board. And so this is be where you would invite somebody to come share it. Um, automation and power ups. These are things that Atlassian has that are extras that you can add to the boards. I'm not really going to get into those because a lot of those are associated with paid accounts. Um, but just be aware that you can add some automation. You can also add things like specific types of fields and whatnot. Like they do have a plugin that specifically to turn this into a more scrum style or agile style board, like a Fibonacci sequence. Mm -hmm. So you can pick story points. Mm -hmm. So power ups do things like that. They give you sort of extra little boost things. I think there's a calendar one mm -hmm. in there that lets you create a calendar out of your cards if you've got like deadlines set on them. But you don't really have to do all of that. You can just come in here and just set up your board. And it can be whatever you want. Now, this is where the organization thing kind of comes in. It's great for this, but I could set it up totally differently. If this is not my working style, I could set this up to be much more complex and to have a lot more lists than this. Now, I've not yet found an upper limit to the number of lists it will let you add. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking and you're wrong. You do not want to put unlimited numbers of lists on your Trello board, because once you have start having to scroll to the right, it gets really, really hard to manage. So to kind of keep in mind, you do not want to have a big, huge block of lists unless you're not going to use most of the ones to the right, because it's going to get hard to manage really, really fast. Right. Um, you can move these lists around. If I decided I wanted done to come before working, I can do that. And it's just as simple as click and drag. Do all the cards in that list over there? Yes, they do. They once, the, once they're in the list, they stay in the list unless you specifically move them out of it. So you can have it, all these different ones if I wanted to say, um, or, It's that simple. So does anybody have any more questions about lists or anything like that before we? No, just the, the observation that speaks to um, how lean this is, is that everything you're doing, like saying the background, you didn't have to go into config dialogue and submit it and have it update. No. Nope. You do that in real time and the list movement is in real time. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, and not, not in a negative comparison to Jira, because Jira is heavier, heavier weight. But if I was managing a board and I wanted to make a new list, I'd have to go into configuration, set up the new list, mm -hmm. potentially associate statuses, mm -hmm. save it, and get back. Or <laughs> you just did a quick list for this. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And the same thing, if I was on this board with somebody else and somebody else moved to the publish list, mm -hmm. I would see that happen as it happened. Right. Now, the, the only caveat to that is if somebody is updating the text in a card, you won't see that happen real time. You won't see that until you close the card and open it again after they're done. Yeah. But if they move the card from one list to another, you'll see that in real time, which is one of the things that makes it a really nice way to collaborate because as people are moving things around, you're seeing that all happen. And it's not you're not having to wait. There's not a delay for that, which sometimes is annoying when you're in JIRA because it's like, oh, I just fixed this. Refresh, refresh, refresh. With this, there's a lot less of that that goes on. Yeah, a lot less toe stepping. A lot of, I want to move into the status. You can't do that anymore. It's mm -hmm. a new status and you didn't know. 
And it'll indicate who actually when somebody's in there working on it. So you can easily see that somebody's in the process of. No, it does not do that. Okay. So I wasn't sure, like, how does it wait to make sure? No. Once you open the card, you'll see what was there when you opened it. Right. Um, but if somebody else is updating the card while you're updating it, you're not going to see their changes until you close it and reopen it. Okay. So it's still possible to step on toes, but you just try to be careful. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a, it, it, It'll let you know if you're stepping on the toe because okay. it'll tell you you can't update the card because somebody else has got it open. Okay. Okay. That's good. <laughs> so, so it does do that. All right. So we did kind of talk about lists. And so for me, just to sort of, because I'm an organizational freak, <laughs> lists should be all apples or all oranges. <laughs> do not mix your apples and your oranges. Um, that's one of the ways that people start messing up the boards is if you have lists, those lists should be all sort of at the same level. So like in agile, the list level is great for epics. The list level is also great for features. Please do not have a list of epic and the list of feature unless you have some really, really good way of denoting that because it's going to make it a lot more confusing for people who are trying to use it. So like I said, it, if, you, if you're mixing your organizational levels at the list level, you're gonna start running into problems keeping it organized. In Kanban, I showed you there were the status columns. Um, make your list names make sense. And the other thing that I wanted to warn you about is you cannot delete things on Trello. You can only archive them. Good question. Mm -hmm. After you archive it, it does give you the option now to delete. Yeah, you can, but you you have to deliberately go in. If you are looking to try to delete it, it's not going to let you. It's going to ask you to archive it. So you have to archive it first and then go in. And you're going to do that here in your in your menu is you're going to have to go into the archives and delete things. So just if you're looking and I know this because I did look. <laughs> if you're looking to delete a card or a list, it's not going to let you. You're going to have to archive it first. Question about previous card man. You're talking about uh, organization regarding features and epics. Mm -hmm. you don't want to to. How would you push that exact issue? Yeah, would you use like two different boards? No, I will show you in a minute. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I will show you in a minute. There is a way that I like to do this, but you have to kind of get down to the card level to see how I do it. Okay. Um, now, again, you can do it other ways if you like. And so also the other thing is there is a menu. You can move lists around via the menu in the corner of each list. So you'll see how it says move list here. You can actually specify where you want it to go. So now I want it on the board personal. It is now in position four. If I come here, I can change it to be in position two. So you... That helps if you have a whole bunch of ones roll, rolling off to the right. It helps to be able to move it without having to actually drag it across several screens. So these menus do allow you to, to add and copy and move things around without having to physically drag them around or hit the buttons. If you copy a list, will it copy all the cards within the list too? Or is it just the list? Um, I think it copies the cards as well. Let me take a look. Copy list. Done. Yeah. <laughs> it copies the cards too. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> See how easy it is? <laughs> I can go find out right now. 
So yeah, you have the menus that allow you to move the lists around and things like that, just in case, you know, because you might get a whole bunch of them running off to the right side. And instead of scrolling, sometimes it's just easier to use the lists to move things and copy things and whatnot. All right, next we have cards. Now cards are gonna be the workhorses here. These are going to be the things that are really going to hold your data or whatever else it is that you need to keep track of. It's where your content lives. The nice thing about these is unlike the rest of the stuff, it does not have to be the same. The card can have its own internal structure. You can put whatever you want on the card. They do not have to look all the same. I love checklists. Trello has checklists built into the cards that you can add. Mm -hmm. I love Trello checklists. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> all right, so card basics. You've already seen me do the card basic here. You can just go to the list and it will literally give you the option to add a card right there at the bottom of the list. You type the title, hit enter and boom, you have a card. Of course, you probably want more than just the title on the card. Now there is an edit menu over here that allows you to do several different things. The first being open the card, but it also lets you edit things like labels, change members, that sort of thing. So you can do some things straight from that menu without having to open the card directly, which comes in handy when you're trying to do some things real quick. Um, but here's your card. So you've got your title here, and this is gonna be the part that you're gonna be the most visual on the list. So that's what you're gonna see as far as the writing is concerned. And you'll see on this one, I actually do have a nice little plug-in for story points. I added that one to this particular list. And I can watch this card if I want to, to get notifications if somebody changes it. The description is going to be something that's default on all the cards. So this will be, here's my basic content. Now it will not say, now with the text, you do have to save it for it to show up. Now, if I just like leave there and don't save it, you'll see it disappeared. Or sometimes it does, but you can come back here and even if you didn't save it, it might still have it there for you to, for you to pull up. So I can save it there and oh look, now I have my basic content. It's gonna give you this, this is an activity log. These are your comments. People can add comments. Um, it has some of the same basic features as Jira, like you can add somebody or something like that. Um, but over here in this add to card is where you can do a whole bunch of fun extras. Members. I can go in here and literally search for somebody who has a JIRA, who has a JIRA account or who's on this board, and I can add them. Like, oh, look, now it's assigned to me. <laughs> and you can add as many people as you want. So this is a fantastic way of keeping track because one of the things that you can do at the board level is you can actually filter by this. So you can filter your board so you only see the cards that have those members on them. There's other filter features as well, but that one's a very useful one. So especially if you're doing like a scrum board or something, I just want to see all the cards that are assigned to me. Well, there's a filter for that. And this is how you designate which members are on the card. I used this a lot in my previous life because they designed training. So they were very often doing that in groups of two to four people. So we could actually, and unlike Jira, which only lets you put like one person on the card, this one, I could actually put as many people as I wanted and say, okay, you're all assigned to this card. <laughs> Labels. This is where you can actually create little designations. They show up as little colored tiles. 
So you can kind of keep track in a second dimension. Now I know what you're thinking and you are wrong. <laughs> you cannot simply run rampant with these because this is part number two where people mess up their JIRA organization. The first part is there's a limited number of colors that you have available for labels. Mm -hmm. So if you pick something to, to label for that has too many variables, pretty soon you're going to be start reusing your colors, which is going to defeat the purpose of having it as a quick reference. Uh, the second problem that you're going to run into is that people try to use these labels to denote multiple different types of things. And it starts to get very, very confusing when a label could mean this is the topic, it could mean this is the deadline, it could mean this is um, the type of deliverable we're creating. Like if you start mixing what those labels denote, mm -hmm. they very quickly start to lose meaning. And so that is part number two of how people mess up their Trello organization. <laughs> Be very careful how you're using labels. They are wonderful because you can, in point of fact, see very quickly at a glance what category something falls into, and it lets you customize these labels however you want. You'll notice here, I've written out what the label is. I can come in here and edit this any way I want and say I wanted this to say writing personal instead of professional or whatever. So you see, they've got a lot of colors, but it is a limited number. Right. But um, you don't have a limit on the number of labels you can have in your form. Not that I have encountered. And so you just run, it's like you said earlier, you run the risk of repeating colors. Yes. Yes, if you have too many, you will repeat colors and then it, you start to lose the purpose of having a color. But you'll see that now when I've closed it, that label is actually showing up on here. Now, if I click this, it will show it so it's only the color. And if I click it again, it'll expand it so I see the color and whatever I wrote. So that is helpful depending on what sort of view you like best. And again, depending on what you're denoting, you could have multiple colors on there, but too many labels, too much mixing, and all of a sudden the colors just sort of blend together and it doesn't really doesn't really help. Are labels limited to the instance of the board they're created on? Yes. So if I had another board in the same workspace, I'd have to create those labels again and have the same structure? Yes. Yeah. Yes. But that also means I won't run into that noise issue if I had to show my labels across the entire workspace. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. You you can you'd have to recreate the labels, but, but. That's part of the hyper customization. Again, yep. if you have one board and you want the labels to mean one thing and another board and you want the labels to mean something else, even if they're within the same workspace, they, they can mean two different things. Yeah. That's a good yeah. So like I said, just be careful when you're using the labels that you have a pretty good understanding of what you're using them for or otherwise they start to cascade and now you've got labels all over the place and the colors stop meaning anything. They also, I believe, have a colorblind feature for these as well. Yeah, on the label dialog. Mm -hmm. So I don't have it activated, but if you were colorblind, you could still use the labels because they do have a colorblind mode. The next is my favorite. <laughs> it is a checklist. I give it a name and boom, I can add items to one, to do two. And then it gives me a little thing where I can check it off. It even has options over here, like setting deadlines for specific to do items, assigning members to the specific to do items. I can convert one to its own card if I discover that it's just too big. Like promoting a subtask. Like promoting a subtask. And I can delete it if I don't need it. This one, it will let you delete and not just archive. These are wonderful because I find that, especially within the agile sense, I can come up here in the description. I can put in things like my user story, my acceptance criteria. 
And then I can actually have a separate list of tasks of things that I have to do that I can check off. I could add another one if I wanted my acceptance criteria to be its own separate checklist. So there, it doesn't have to be just one checklist. I can have multiple checklists. Absolutely. If I really, really want multiple checklists, I can and have your implementation checklist. And your mm -hmm. now, these checklists, could you, for example, and I know this is algebra two, but could you set up an automation that when the checklist is finished, it moves it automatically? Is that? I believe that is actually one of the things that's part of their automation process is that if you do a certain thing, like get to the end of the checklist, it will automatically do whatever you program it to do. Again, you won't learn that till algebra two, but. Possibly <laughs> algebra three. Algebra three, I believe, is called uh, not trigonometry. Pre-calculus, I think. Yeah, you won't learn that till pre-calculus. But yes, I, I believe it, it does have automation and it does do certain things like that. I don't know if it ties directly to a checklist, but I suspect that it does. So you can have multiple checklists. I love that. You can set due dates and reminders for those due dates. And this is a standard thing. This is not like their calendar features or anything like that. It's your standard due dates. If I want this to be due say next week boom there you go there's my due date now you can check it off when it's done how does that remind your math um, email that accounts email i believe that there is a setting for that i haven't used it that's fine right um because it also changes color on the board itself mm -hmm. I think it emails it to people, but it also will change color here the closer you get to that deadline. So if that deadline were today, it would highlight it in a different color. Cool. And if you're past the deadline, then it highlights it again in a different color so that you know that you totally missed your deadline. <laughs> <laughs> and if I check it off, you'll see it now is marked as complete. Cool. Attachments. This is the lovely place where you can attach things. Now, you can attach files and that's perfectly fine. But the lovely thing that you can also do is you can attach other cards and boards on Trello to your card. <laughs> so here, as you can see, you've got the card or board to add, and it's giving me a list of other cards and boards that I already have. So here's some cards and this, I can search for them, but it kind of defaults to sort of the last ones you touched. So if I wanted to attach my writing template to this card, you can see now it's got a link to that card. And if I hit connect cards, what it'll do is it'll take, it'll go to that other card and it will also put a link to this card on the other card. Mm -hmm. So it does not automatically do it on the other card. But if you hit connect cards, it will relate them both. And that allows me to actually toggle back and forth. So now you can see I'm on my other board looking at my other card. So that is a fantastic feature, especially when you're trying to when you're trying to use Trello in a more complex way. Right. Is it allows you very quickly and easily to go back and forth between different boards. So that way I could say, have my daily scrum board with just what we're working on right now, but all of those cards are related to cards that are on a board that's specific to a different project. So if I had five projects running, I could have a board for each, toggle back and forth between there and not have to recreate the cards on two separate boards. I can just click the button, relate them, and then they go back and forth, everything stays in one spot but I don't have to worry about people not being able to find it. You can do the same thing with a whole separate board. This one is a card in particular. If I just want to link to the board, it also allows me to do that. Like that it opened it right at the card level too. Mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. So like I said, it'll let you do links. It'll let you do files. Um, I said I was helping a friend of mine write a book. 
and he was uploading his chapters directly onto the Trello cards, just dropping a Word document right there on the Trello card and saying, hey, go take a look at this. And I could go in and I could read it and I could leave him critiques and comments right on the card. And he would always have a running list of what I'd said. Or if I did it in a Word document, I could upload a new Word document and said, here's your, here's your critiques. So like I said, it's giving you a lot of flexibility in how you want to work with each other and how you want to, to, to categorize and deal with that information. It also, as you'll notice, does things like OneDrive and Dropbox or Google Drive. So if you're using some other sort of collaborative tool, you can link to that pretty easily too. And covers. This is where you get to have a little bit of fun because much like you can customize a board background, you can also customize the covers on a card. Now they have two different types. The first one, Okay, I'm gonna pick yellow because it matches the flowers. The first one, when you're looking at it in the list view, will only put a stripe of color at the top. And then the regular information that you would normally see. The other one turns the whole card that color. And you also have the option of adding images. And this one will let you upload your own image. And in fact, if you drag and drop an image file to a Trello card, it sort of automatically assumes you want that to be the cover for the card. <laughs> oh, so not an attachment. No, it doesn't. It, it, it automatically assumes you want that attachment that is an image to be the cover of your card. <laughs> it, you can tell it not to be, but it assumes that. <laughs> Why were you looking at the cover? You didn't want to see the cover. <laughs> exactly. So down here again, they have a link to Unsplash. So if you wanted to add your picture from Unsplash, you can do that as well. Um, but when we were talking about epics and features, this is one of the ways that I actually create a feature. So You'll see here, I've got this, you can just change it so that it's got a background cover color and then just put in a single card that's the name of your feature. So I could change this one to say, this is feature one. Come in and with my cover, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna change the, the color, probably the full thing there. And now you look feature one and everything underneath of it can be part of feature one. Mm -hmm. Using it like a divider. So I can call this epic one, feature one, and then there is my user story. And I have found that this cover thing is also very nice if you're working with stakeholders, if you have some very visual things going on, because it makes it very instantaneously easy to see what's what's good and, and like what's differentiated. Um, going over to my podcast board, you can see I can put different covers on there for the different stories that I'm working on. I, I don't have really great taste in art, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but as you can see, I've got here, here's my posting schedule. And this is where I've denoted what my little labels mean. So this is an easy reference for me and it's got all of my dates and stuff on here. Here's my in progress list. And I have some, you know, here's a template down here. So this is where it comes in handy that my cards don't all have to look the same because here's my episodes, but here's my template that I can use 
to copy things into. Now, the other fun thing about this is if you come down to the bottom here, you will see that there are some actions. Much like with everything else, I can move this just by hitting this button and it will give me, like I can very precisely dictate to it where it moves that card, including across boards. Mm -hmm. So if you just wanna get it off this board and onto another one, if you hit this move button, it will let you actually take it off the board and put it onto a different board. So you can see here's the board, the destination board, here's the list, and then here's the position in the list. So would a scenario for that be something like moving it to a QA tester board, for example, or a mm -hmm. testing board? Mm -hmm. So if you were working on one project and they said, oh yeah, really, we need this to move over to a different project, you can just move the whole card. Right. You don't have to remake it at all. Yeah, you can move it off of a bug board into an enhancement board. So however you organized it, if you decide that it needs to be in a different, different project, different category, you can move it right there. You can copy it. So this will give you the option to straight up copy it. You can turn it into a template. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna use the same thing over and over and over mm -hmm. again, you can turn it into your own template. You can also archive it or share it. So these are fairly standard, but like I said, the move is nice because it allows you to move it around without having to recreate it, especially across boards, which can get a little bit tricky. I like that the copy also had a destination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It does. You keep all your templates in one place and then report. So I think I kind of moved through tables. And, and, and here's the things you're not going to learn until Algebra 2. Power-ups. They're on there. There are some of them that are free. Um, like I said, they're going to be adding functionality, things like your Fibonacci sequence for estimating story points. Um, there's one to give you like a sprint burn down chart or something. So they have a lot of these extra little add-ins. I don't really have time to go into all of the different ones. And some of them are paid versus just being available for free. Uh, card automation. They do have a lot of options now for automating activities. You can automate how things move across your lists. Um, but a lot of that is tied to paid accounts as well. And I did also mention on here, there is an app for the iPhone and Android. So you can use it in an app. So if you don't have, um, so if you don't have access to your computer, there you go, right there. It works slightly differently. But as you can see, here's my lovely little personal workspace. It's the exact same one as it's on my computer. And there's all the stuff that I just added. And if I want to look at that card, I can just click on it and open it. So like I said, it doesn't work exactly the same as the one on the, on the, on the, the web-based, but it's got the same features. You just have to, you just have to activate them slightly differently. You have a couple of examples of how they differ between mobile versus a desktop in terms of how they work differently? Um, moving things around, I believe in the mobile app, you have to use the button and specify where you want to move it to because it doesn't drag as easily. Oh, okay. um, because it's got limited, like you can see, I've got this open. I can't, it, it, it's, I can't really drag it because it's using the, the screen feature to, to scroll. Um, but I could go into the card itself and then use the, 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 the move button and specify where I, where I wanted to move it to and it would do it that way. So like I said, it's not terribly different, but it's just a little bit of a different interface because it's got to accommodate the mobile features. But like I said, if you have a to-do list or if you have something that you're collaborating with somebody on, you can get to this via your phone pretty easily and kind of go in and make any changes or updates on the go, which I've seen people do. 
and may or may not have done a few times myself <laughs> when I was on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Yes. When you're closing out work on your Trello board, is the understanding that you just drag it to a done list and it'll live there forever until you delete it? Or is there some sort of cleanup utility that happens? Like after two weeks or a month, it's no big set of service. Like I believe you could automate a cleanup, but it does not inherently do so. Okay. So like, for instance, if I wanted, like, if I'm going to go to my other board here, because I kind of, I was a history major in college. So like, I don't like to delete anything. <laughs> but as you can see, going over here, I'm on season three of my podcast, you can see I have season one and season two, where I just moved all of the cards over to their own list. And they're just going to kind of live there. And they'll stay there until I either archive the cards or archive the list. So it's not actually going to go away unless I tell it to. And that's kind of the other thing about Trello is, is it, unless you set up the automation yourself, it's not doing it automatically. You have to do it, which I love <laughs> and some people really hate. <laughs> right. But I like that it's going to stay there and it's going to be the way I set it up until I change it. So like I said, season one's not gonna automatically delete itself unless I set up automation to tell it to automatically delete itself. But if I wanted to delete it, I could delete this whole list or archive it and then it would go away. Is there a statute of limitations on archived files? Like do they eventually clean out? archives or is that in perpetuity? Uh, that I don't know. I haven't actually gone in and tried to unarchive something that was older than about six months. Mm -hmm. So That's right. <laughs> I'm assuming at some point they do, yeah. um, but it's not something that I've actually run into. All right. Did you have any other questions? I know I'm hitting right about the time there. Does anybody have any other questions or anything that you wanted to cover that I didn't cover? How complex was your most complex Trello board? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, going to my workspaces when I used to work at my old job, I had a fairly complex system going on where I was running a I was running a daily scrum board and then we had all of the individual boards for all of the different um, projects. And that kind of got pretty complex because there were there was constant linking back and forth to different boards. And so this is where I can say from experience, if it's big enough to need a database, you probably should would better go with the database <laughs> because the constant upkeep on the Trello is going to be too much overhead once the project gets too complex. Right. Um, you're, you're not going to want to keep that up. It's, gonna, it's not going to be current. It's going to be hard to find things because they're going to be spread across boards or they're going to be spread too far through all of your different lists and whatnot. And then it just defeats the purpose of making it easy to view at that point if you're having to constantly scroll and look and can't find things. Um, it's the same way it would be if you had a spreadsheet set up and there's just too many tabs and too many columns. And after a while, it's like, why am I doing this? I need a database. So on that idea, is there a way to move Trello boards into JIRA? Or is that a manual process? There is a way to export boards, we discovered. <laughs> because we were doing a very similar thing to that. We were trying to move over off of Trello and into a more traditional database, um, Azure DevOps in that particular instance. Um, so you can export Jira boards. 
but there is a limit to what they put on there. So if you have all the pretty pictures and checklists and stuff, those really don't export, <laughs> but you can export the information off of your cards into a couple of different formats right. um, that would allow you to take that and import it into some other database program. So, so you mentioned that you use Trello a lot for you know personal mm -hmm. projects and whatnot. Have you run into a situation? I know you use Jira at work, but have you been in a situation in the past where you both where you used both Jira and Trello? And if so, what did that look like? Or was it usually just if you have Jira, then you're just going to use Jira even for the most simplest of stuff? Um, we were using Trello instead of Jira. Um, again, because Jira was not flexible enough for what my training team was doing and the ability to add some of the other elements that were more visual was a lot more helpful. And we couldn't fit what we were doing easily into the structure that Jira was imposing on us or in this case, Azure DevOps was going to impose upon us because they were like epic feature user story. And we were kind of like, well, <laughs> it's a little more diverse than that because we were developing training, which we could have fit into that epic feature user story format if we'd been trying pretty hard. Um, but we were also delivering training. So it's like, it's not really a user story. It's we developed this thing. Now we have to go out and give the class. And we did that over and over and over and over again. <laughs> so it wasn't really a new deliverable. It was, but it was something we had to account for as far as people's time within the, the course of the sprint. Because if somebody is going to drive up to the UP to teach class for two weeks, well, we need to account for that because they're working. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> like they, they get points for that, like story points for that, but it's not really a new deliverable that we're giving to the client either. It's a continuation, you know, that's kind of where training differed a lot is that usually once you deploy your software, you don't have to go back and redeploy it again and again and again and again. Well, in training you do. <laughs> 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 in training it's like oh great we created the class now we have to go teach it and we have to go teach it again and we have to go teach it again <laughs> you know so anything else questions comments random trivia <laughs> What's the name of your podcast? It is called Tales from Mortimer Poe. And it's just short stories that I wrote. And I just read them because I enjoy that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, if we're doing random plugs, I just got uh, published in this book called Never Too Old to Save the World. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. And the story that I wrote is the very first one called Lean In, the Lord of Hell is Coming. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that explains the uh, hell. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I believe the name of this story was Hell is Where the Heart Is. <laughs> this one's called The Problem with the Apocalypse. <laughs> yes, <laughs> singular problem. problem. Yes. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, the problem with the apocalypse is it's not the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, these are just some of my weird podcast titles. <laughs> Love it. Very well done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you. No control expert. <laughs> hey, this is just the basics. I just skimmed the surface, but it's enough. The, the other thing I really like about Trello is it doesn't require a lot of effort to get up and running. Yeah. And most people take to it pretty intuitively. 
So if you're dealing with somebody who's not going to want to deal with the structure of JIRA or another database program, Trello is a great alternative because again, it's going to be highly visual. Most of it's pretty intuitive. Um, it's got an app so people don't have to have a special knowledge or download or something to make it work. And it's great with communicating with people outside of your organization as well, so that they can come in and see it. it's like, oh, I've got a mock up of a brochure. Well, you just stick it in Trello, they can go in and open the card and look at it and leave a comment and it operates a lot like Jira, except that you didn't have to have them go through the overhead of like knowing how to use it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 